actually good night in here in Iran and good afternoon to Dr. Cheng, um, who's based at the UK. Um, before I actually introduce Dr. Cheng, uh, I would like to actually uh, very briefly talk about these TPCF webinars. So TPCF is the Teher uh, Tehran University of Medical Sciences preclinical core facility, and where we have uh, a comprehensive um, packages of various different modalities for uh, preclinical imaging. And so we wanted to actually create a community where anyone who's interested in uh, preclinical imaging would gather around um, a virtual kind of table or a setting. And especially with this COVID, literally everything's right now uh, virtual, nothing's real in a sense. And so in order to uh, create a platform where uh, various different um, students, scientists, from various different disciplines could sit down together and discuss the beautiful concept of preclinical imaging and what it could uh, offer. Um, so it's an honor that uh, we have uh, Dr. Vinton Cheng, who uh, is based at the uh, University of Leeds. Um, his title is going to be on functionalized microparticles of iron oxide with, uh, with preclinical MRI to improve detection of brain tumors. So briefly, if I want to mention, um, introduce Dr. Chen, uh, he's um, an honorary special, a speciality registrar in medical oncology at the Leeds Cancer Center and academic clinical lecturer with a research interest in brain metastases. Dr. Chen, uh, I don't know if you can hear me or not. Um, it's an honor to have you and uh, platform all yours. Brilliant, thank you. Let me just try and share my screen. Um, so I just want to thank the organizer, first of all, for inviting me to give this talk. It's an honor to, and a pleasure to be able to present some of the work that I've been doing here in the UK. Greetings from a very wet UK, and I believe it's good evening to everyone in Tehran. So very nice to meet you all, even in these very strange times. So as um, has been kindly introduced, uh, my work is focused on detection of brain tumors. Um, I'm going to talk specifically about the work that I did at the University of Oxford as part of my PhD. And this was um, involving the use of targeted um, contrast agents to detect brain tumors using preclinical MRI. So um, I don't have any disclosures to declare. Um, and so why do we care about brain tumors? Well, we know that they cause significant morbidity. Brain tumors, although they're not co as common as some of the other types of cancers like breast cancer, lung cancer, they can cause major um, problems for patients who suffer from them. And they're a great fear for cancer patients. Um, they can cause symptoms such as speech and visual disturbance, changes in personality, loss of functional reasoning, memory loss, seizures, limb weaknesses, and also balance problems. And of course, if the brain tumor continues to grow, then ultimately it can cause death. Now, as I said, although it's not a very common type of tumor, we know it is an escalating problem. Brain tumors, in particular primary brain tumors, generally affects um, people of the older age. So the most common age group will, where, which will develop primary brain tumors are between the ages of 60 to 70. And of course, for other types of brain tumors, like secondary brain tumors, they will also um, fit in with their, with their typical cancer type. Now, interestingly, the incidence of brain tumors is actually rising and we're not entirely certain of why. Um, we're still trying to understand what, what is the underlying cause of these tumors. Perhaps the most obvious reason is that we're increasingly using brain, brain imaging. Um, like MRI and CT scans, and therefore we're more likely to detect these tumours. Now, when we talk about brain tumours, actually it's quite a heterogeneous group. The most common types are actually, um, in particular we're thinking of malignant um, brain tumours, arise from, as a secondary, from other cancers outside of the brain, and we call these brain metastases. And so the most, most common types, as you can see in this pie chart here, um, arise from, let me just bring up my pointer, um, lung cancers, breast cancers, and melanoma. And they form in total of around 80% of all brain metastases. Other types which can contribute include kidney cancers, bowel cancers, and sarcomas. They usually present late in the phase of um, someone's metastatic disease. 
And typically the prognosis for patients who suffer from secondary brain tumors is very poor, usually in the region of weeks to months. Although, as we'll talk about, um, there have been some recent advances, which means that patients with brain metastases are surviving for longer, but these tend to be a more select few. And the other type of tumour which we generally associate with malignancy in the brain is um, glioblastoma. So this is the most common and the most aggressive primary brain malignancy. Um, it arises from astrocytes, so these are the most common cells within the brain, um, other than the neurons. And the, the typical feature of the glioblastoma is that it is diffusely infiltrative, usually travelling along vessels and also the nerve tracts. And so they're very difficult to remove. And there have been case series that are kind of going back to the 1920s, where surgeons have tried to remove almost half the brain or the hemisphere of the brain, and actually these tumours are coming back again, which suggests that actually they, they're extending and they're very infiltrative. And therefore, the gold standard of treatment currently combines surgery, radiotherapy and chemotherapy. And despite our most aggressive managements, survival still only measures around 15 months. Um, so these are very deadly tumours. And really sadly, treatment has hardly changed over the past 15 years. So we really do need better treatments for this type of tumour. Now we know for brain tumours, um, local therapies tend to be the most effective. And when I talk about local therapies, we mean surgery, so the removal of the tumour, and radiotherapy, the delivery of X-ray treatment to the brain. Drugs, um, so systemic therapies, generally are less effective, and that's because of this unit here called the blood-brain barrier. So we know that the brain is encased within a very specialised vasculature, which is separate from the rest of the blood circulation. And what you can see here are the blood vessel, which is surrounded by these parasites and astrocytes, which form a barrier around the blood vessel. So that stops the free diffusion of drugs, substances across the brain. I mean, usually that's protective against things like toxins, um, infections. However, in this situation, it also impedes our ability to deliver effective treatments. And we know that the most common form of treatment that we use systemically is, cy is cytotoxic chemotherapy, and these generally have a very poor penetration into the brain. However, there are other drugs which can have some effects like hormone therapies, immunotherapies, and small molecule inhibitors. And, more, and we're starting to see better ability to penetrate the blood-brain barrier, and therefore there is hope that we may have drugs in the future which will be effective against these types of cancers. Now to detect brain tumours, our current gold standard is with imaging and CT is or com computer tomography is the most common form of um, imaging that we use for patients. Um, but actually for the brain, the best, um, the best modality is actually MRI and that's a gold standard for detecting and also treatment planning. And that's because, as you can see here, MRI provides superior um, anatomical characterization, particularly with the soft tissue, um, compared to CT. And, and we'll discuss a bit more about the physics behind that and why MRI is superior to CT. But you'll see here, um, these are both CTs of, of patients who have a brain tumour. Um, and usually in oncological imaging, we'll combine imaging with a contrast agent. So before contrast agent, we can see some changes here, but it's not obvious. And after we apply a contrast agent, for example, in CT, we tend to use iodine-based contrast agents. We can see what we call a ring enhancing lesion. So the edge of the tumor lights up. And in MRI, we tend to use a gadolinium-based contrast agent. Um, and this is a, what we call a T1-weighted sequence. And we can see the tumor here, which wasn't previously seen, now light up. And of course, the, the great thing about MRI is that it isn't just one um, modality. It's actually, we can use different parameters to highlight different biological features. And this is a, an example of a T2-weighted imaging where we can see in the spaces in between in the ventricles and in the um, cerebral spinal fluid, it actually shows up as white. So here fluid um, tends to shine up brightly with a more intense signal and that we can use that to, for example, to detect edema. 
or swelling around the tumor. Now, these contrast agents are obviously effective However, they do rely on the breakdown of the blood-brain barrier. So this disruption of the blood-brain barrier, which can be caused by the tumor um, when it grows. And that's, that's when it's effective. But for smaller tumors, unfortunately, because there is no blood-brain barrier breakdown when the tumors are small, we can't see them. And that limits the resolution of both MRI and CT scan. Now, what we know about the biology of these tumors, as I've mentioned before, is that they are very invasive. And for glioblastoma, this is very well documented. You'll see here on a scan um, where it's been outlined in red and compared to the post-mortem image of the brain with the glioblastoma, that this tumor does extend quite far. Now, it's not so obvious, actually, right at the edges of the tumor. There is some subtle changes, but it's not really obvious. We do have the bulk of the tumor here, which shows up quite nicely in white, but otherwise, the rest of it is actually quite difficult to delineate compared to on histology. And that, again, also highlights the limitations that we have currently with MRI and detecting the invasive margin. Now, for brain metastases, we typically think of this as being a very well demarcated tumor. So you can see here, it's actually quite smooth. Um, the border is very smooth. There's a sharp difference between the edge of the tumor and the brain. And so traditionally, we've always thought of brain metastases as not being particularly invasive. However, more recent evidence has suggested based on post-mortem study, autopsy studies, and also um, prospective biopsies has shown that actually, yes, these tumours here as the edge, and you see little islands of cells breaking off. So these tumours are also um, invasive. And why is this important? Well, obviously any treatments that we deliver, particularly for local therapies, it relies on us being able to capture all of the cancer. And if we don't, then there's a risk that any remaining cancer that hasn't been treated, whether it's by surgery, so either cut out, or by being hit with radiotherapy, means that has the potential to grow again in the future. And that raises the risk of recurrence. So what you'll see here is we very much aim to achieve what we call negative margins. So an area of tissue around the tumor, which is we know is normal without any signs of cancer. And where there are positive margins, so where the cancer extends beyond the extent of the, of the, the margins of the surgical resection or the radiotherapy, then we know that there will be some cancer which hasn't been treated and has carries a risk of coming back again in the future. However, in the brain, obviously we also have to be very careful because this is an important organ. And if we take too much normal tissue or if we damage the normal brain, then there's also the risk of causing injury to the patient and symptoms and side effects as well. So the aim is very much to remove all of the tumor but minimize the amount of normal tissue that we involve as well. And here you can see an example of some radiotherapy planning where the um, radiotherapists, in order to decide where they will target the radiotherapy, will use the scans that we have available to draw around the tumor and also apply a level of a margin around the tumor to ensure that the radiotherapy hits not only what we can see, but also where we know the tumor cells are likely to have spread beyond the margin, because we, we already recognize the limits of the imaging. So, I mean, you probably are all aware of this, but I, I think it's worth going over mainly, mainly for my benefits, because um, I'm not a, a physicist, is MRI physics relies very much on protons. So protons are abundant, particularly in water, um, in our body, and in the brain in particular, as it is largely composed of water, obviously this makes MRI a very powerful tool to image the brain. So MRI um, relies on the pro what we call proton spin. So every proton rotates on an axis and has a level of spin. And in the tissue, obviously multiple protons exist and between tissue compartments, depending on the chemical com composition of the tissue, um, the spin will be different. And also other aspects such as the size of the molecules, what other, um, and the, for example, fatty content. Now, MRI, the MRI scanners comprises a very strong magnet. And what that does is it causes all of these protons to become aligned. And then when we want to image, 
we apply a radio frequency pulse. This knocks the um, proton out of its axis, out of the aligned axis, um, and it will revert to where it was previously. But then because the, once the radio frequency pulse has been removed, then the protons will gradually start to return to their steady state or their aligned state again. And when it does this, or what we call relaxation, the when as a proton returns to its kind of aligned state, it releases signal that we can detect and um, we can then recreate an image out of that. And so if we consider that the magnetic field is here, if we measure as the um, alignment of the proton returns in the longitudinal axis, we call this T1 relaxation, and this allows us to detect what we call the T1 effect. As the proton realigns in the transverse plane, then that gives us what we call the T2 relaxation. Um, it's also called dephasing. Now the thing is with the T2 signal, um, the T2 signal is actually as, as the proton dephases in the transverse axis, it actually loses signal. So it shows up um, as faster T2 means that we get less signal, so darker areas. Now in a perfect um, magnetic field, what we'll see is that there will be a very gradual and um, uh, gradual fall in the signal. However, we know that this system is imperfect. So the machines that we use, they never produce a perfect, mag perfectly homogeneous magnetic field. And also within the tissue itself, there may be characteristics which disturb the magnetic field, for example, iron particles. And because of these inhomogene inhomogeneities, actually there is more disturbance within the magnetic field. And within that, therefore, you can get localized, more localized drop in signal and we call this the T2 star effect. And we, so we try to, ex, we can exploit this effect um, to use uh, for, for imaging, for example, by kind of trying to detect more of this dephasement in areas which may contain kind of high iron content. Um, so we call this T2 star weighted imaging or gradient echo imaging. And typically um, what you'll see here is a T2 weighted image and areas which are dark actually have, um, a, um, have a greater T2 star effect. And so what you'll see here in this area is a dark spot, a high, what we call a hypo intense region. And that indicates that there's more of a disruption to the magnetic field here, which is why you get more of a T2 star effect and it's darker. And we're currently using this effect um, for imaging things like stroke and bleeds. So we were also interested in the biology of the tumor and in particular in these particular um, molecules called cell adhesion molecules. So cell adhesion molecules are expressed on the cell surfaces and in particular in white blood cells and also in the um, endothelial cells. So in this schematic diagram you'll see here this white blood cell in the circulation so within a blood vessel these are endothelial cells and on them they usually express some um, endothelial adhesion molecule, some cell, cell adhesion molecules or CAMs. And one example is VLA4 with its counter ligand VCAM1, LFA1 and ICAM1. These are just a few examples. There are many, many more, for example, E-selectin, P-selectin. But I, I'm just choosing these two in particular. And we were particularly interested in this one called VCAM1. So in a physiological state, cell adhesion molecules allow cells to attach to each other. And for example, in this case, um, we have the white blood cells, which will become, for example, in, in turbulent blood flow, um, attached to the endothelial surface. And that allows it to tether and then gradually migrate across the vessel and into the tissue. So these molecules are actually very important um, in a physiological state for normal immune function and are particularly ex overexpressed in pro-inflammatory states. Now we were also interested in um, imaging contrast. So how could we improve MRI? And one way is to improve the contrast agents that we use. 
So to produce a T2 star effect, we use these iron oxide particles, these what we call micro particles of iron oxide. So these are um, small beads, which are up to one micron in size, usually slightly less, and they contain lots of iron oxide particles. And because they contain lots of iron oxide, when it's injected into the tissue or into the blood um, and imaged with the T2, it enhances the T2 star effect. However, we were interested in making them targeted. So we bound around 30,000 um, antibodies to each bead to create these functionalized MPIOs, which is specifically targeted against the VCAM1 protein. We previously shown that these targeted contrast agents are effective in detecting disease. And we use preclinical models for these, um, for example, with multiple sclerosis, which is an autoimmune inflammatory condition um, which involves demyelination in the brain, so inflammation within the brain. And what you can see here is that on these T2 star imaging, we can see these dark lines which highlights areas of inflammation. And similarly in a stroke model, in a rat stroke model, we can show the similar effect there. And so one of the questions we wanted to ask is, well, can we improve the detection of brain tumours, brain metastases, specifically when they're very tiny, using preclinical MRI? And so how could, would, would this work? Um, well, what we know about blood vessels is that they contain this blood-brain barrier, um, which encases these endothelial cells and stops molecules or substances from passing through. So traditionally, unless there is breakdown in this blood-brain barrier, which doesn't happen when the tumors are very tiny, gadolinium molecules will just pass through. So they wouldn't be able to detect these very tiny tumors. And similarly, if we in these, if, if there's no expression of VCAM1, then any VCAM MPIOs that we give will also pass through. However, what we will show and what I'll show you later is that when there's a small amount of tumour there, a very tiny tumour, even though it doesn't disrupt the blood-brain barrier, what it causes is a localised inflammation, which means that um, on the endothelial cells um, adjacent to the tumours, they express as VCAM1. And what that means is that these targeted contrast agents would then bind to this VCAM1 protein and we can then detect it on imaging. So essentially we're using VCAM1 as a surrogate biomarker of these very tiny tumors before we can currently detect them. And what are the important properties that we want of an MRI biomarker in vivo is that we want it to be abundant at early stages of disease. We want it to be able to lie again outside of the blood brain barrier. And also importantly, we don't want this to be shown up on healthy cells as well. So where there is no cancer, we don't want this to be um, present. Otherwise it would mean the test won't be particularly specific. So what you'll see here is um, three different animals with tumors which have been injected into um, their heart and which has traveled to their brain. And so these, these tumors have formed within the brain and we've got three different models here. We've got a lung cancer model. These are all human um, xenograft models, breast cancer and melanoma, and these are all in mice. So the blue here, so the red arrows highlight where the tumor cells are. So that you can see the tumor cells quite densely packed and the black highlights, and the black arrows, sorry, highlights the brown areas, which are staining for VCAM1. And again, here you can see the tumor, and then this brown staining is the blood vessel with expressing VCAM1. And again, a blood vessel here expressing VCAM1. And what we showed is that even with very tiny tumors, they were able to stimulate this localized inflammation. So adjacent to them, you can see this VCAM1 expression. And this is just some immunofluorescence. So we have here um, the green cells are the green are the tumor cells, and then the red are the blood vessels, and on top of the red is the blue, which is the VCAM1 expression. So that's co-localized to the blood vessels. And this is just one example of a tumor, a very tiny tumor, which we've cut through several sections. Um, so this is just cut through the cross section of the tumor from the beginning through the middle to the end. And around them, you'll see multiple vessels here, which have been stimulated 
to produce um, VCAM1. So, and they kind of flow through as we cut through the sections. And this is also important because we've got a very tiny tumor here, which if we were to use a contrast agent that targets the tumor would produce very little signal. But because around it, we, the tumor microenvironment or the stroma is far more abundant, actually that also enhances the signal. And so the experimental methods that we used is we use cultured human cells. So these were cells derived from patients and we injected them into mice through the heart, which would then travel to the brain. And this is a very well characterized model for brain metastases. These tumors would then form over a number of weeks. And then after that, we would inject them with a contrast agent comprising either the VCAM MPIO, so our test contrast agent, or a, um, a non-targeting contrast agent with just a, an isotype um, immunoglobulin. And we also tested this with gadolinium enhanced MRI. And so we imaged these animals on a preclinical seven Tesla MRI. And what you can see here is that in each of these models, the so breast, melanoma and lung, you can see these tiny spots show up where these red arrows are pointing to. And actually these are all showing tiny tumor um, micrometastases which have spread into the brain. And when we tried to detect these with our standard gadolinium enhanced MRI, we couldn't see them. So these were, these were evidence that the VCAM MPIO is detecting things which with conventional imaging we currently can't see. And so when we measured these hyperintensities, importantly, when we compared against and the, the gray bar is the um, non-targeting contrast agents, and the black bars are the VCAM MPIO contrast agents. We showed that we saw more hypo-intense regions in the VCAM MPIO groups. And that's also compared to animals which don't have any brain tumors in them. And what you can see here is that these beads are specifically bound to the, um, to the V, to the VCAM expressing blood vessel. The green is a blood vessel, it's within the tumor. So where this arrow is pointing to are just a couple of small beads which are bound and then when we image them we're seeing them on the scan. And with these are highlighting the tumors. And so that was just one, one utilization that we've demonstrated of this VCAM MPIO contrast agent. So our next question was well can we actually improve the detection of the invasive tumor margin on MRI. So as I mentioned before, one of the problems is not only that we can't detect small tumors, but even where we can detect the tumors, for example, on gadolinium enhanced MRI, we can't clearly see where the edge of the tumor is. And that causes problems for when we try to apply our treatment for treatment planning. And I'll, as, a, as a clear example, a clear clinical example of why this is an issue, what we know is that despite being able to cut these tumors out and being able to deliver high dose radiotherapy or stereotactic radiosurgery, we know that there's a high risk of these tumors coming back again. And this suggests that although we think we've got everything, clearly we haven't. And so with what, what has been shown is that with just surgery alone, about 60% of patients will see the cancer return within a few years after their treatment. And even with radiotherapy, that's around 40%. Now, if we also apply radiotherapy to the whole brain, so-called whole brain radiotherapy on top of surgery and stereotactic radiosurgery, we can also reduce it, but clearly it's not perfect. And so understanding where these tumor cells are traveling to is clearly important. And that gave us added impetus to try to detect the, to try to enhance our current technique to detect um, the invasive margin. And we were very fortunate to be collaborated, to have collaborated with um, some colleagues based in Liverpool, who, um, so Professor Jenkinson's group, who collected MRI scans of patients with brain metastases and were also able to combine that with um, some biopsy samples. So just looking at the MRI, this is a typical gadolinium, this is just a section of a um, gadolinium enhanced MRI of a patient with a brain, brain metastasis. So here you can see it looks like it's very well defined. 
bit of a cystic area inside, which is dark. And we know exactly where they took some biopsy samples. So here we've divided three different regions, the core region, the rim region, and then the adjacent brain. And we also compared that to the contralateral hemisphere. And when we looked at the gray pixel intensity, what we showed is actually um, there wasn't, it wasn't possible to objectively differentiate between the border and the adjacent brain parenchyma. Sure, there is a clear difference between the core and on the, um, the adjacent brain parenchyma, so you can see some difference. However, we're really interested in understanding whether there's a difference in the border of the tumour, at the border of the tumour. And what this showed is actually the numbers don't quite stack up. There, there isn't a significant difference between the two. So by eye, it also highlights some of the subjectivity that radiologists have in trying to delineate um, the brain tumour margin. And again, highlights why it's so difficult to be able to pick out exactly where the tumour cells may have evaded into. And that was the same for breast cancer, lung cancer and melanoma. Now we also looked at a different imaging parameter. So this is what we call diffusion weighted imaging. So diffusion weighted imaging assesses the free, the ability of water to freely diffuse. So areas with high, high kind of restriction of diffusion actually show up more. And that gives an indication of cellularity. So the more cellular an error is, such as this region here, the brighter it shows up. And we can quantify this by measuring something called the apparent diffusion coefficient. So again, doing the same thing, looking at the different regions within the brain. So in the core of the tumour, the rim of the tumour, and in the adjacent parenchyma compared to the contralateral hemisphere, we again showed that there was no significant difference when we were measuring the border compared to the brain right next to the border. And again, that highlights a problem that we have even with different imaging techniques in detecting this very difficult margin. So we decided to go back to what we understood about basic biology. Well, imagine this is a tumor. When it's large, we know that it disrupts the blood-brain barrier, and that means we can detect what we call the core of the tumour very easily. As a tumour grows, it disrupts the blood vessels and adjacent to it. And that means that gadolinium-enhanced um, MRI works very well in detecting the edge of the tumour because the blood-brain barrier is, is disturbed. However, where there's an invasive um, cluster or even where cells break off, this often does not disrupt the blood-brain barrier. And this is really where the challenge is, being able to detect this region here, um, because gadolinium enhanced MRI won't be able to detect it. However, what we know is common between these two sites is that there is inflammation. So there's inflammation right next to the tumour, right next to the tumour core, and also at a more distant um, area adjacent to where there are invading cells. And so again, we, were one, we wanted to know well, is there upregulation of these endothelial expressed adhesion molecules like VCAM1, and can we use that to detect the edge of the tumour? And so these, we were, again, we were fortunate in our collaboration that we had these biopsies which were taken right in those, in those edges from where they thought they could see the edge of the tumour. And here you've got some three representative biopsy samples. So this is unpublished work, which we're, we're kind of getting ready to publish soon, um, with tissue of brain metastases, which I've outlined in pink here, with some normal tissue adjacent to it. So this is tissue which doesn't have any tumor cells inside. And you can see here, we've got a good model where we've got a cluster of tumor and some adjacent parenchyma. And we interrogated this to look at also VCAM1 expression. So what I've done here is I've highlighted in blue um, areas of the tumour and the green here is highlighting where there is VCAM1 positive vessels and the red is where there are vessels but no VCAM1 staining. And it's apparent that most of the VCAM1 is clustered around the edge of the tumour with some spreading further out, 
And actually, these are associated with isolated tumor cells, which are broken off from the tumor. And so what we showed is that endothelial VCAM1 is upregulated along the brain metastasis invasive margin. So as we move closer to the tumor, there are more vessels which are VCAM1 expressing. And as we move further away, that drops off. So we felt that actually we had a very useful marker, sensitive biomarker, which will allow us to detect the brain metastasis margin. And so the methods that we used for the, our next experiment was to actually use rats. So we use rats because they have a, a larger head and therefore the resolution of imaging would be better than with mice. And we, the model that we used is with intrastriatal injections. So these were injections direct into the brain of tumor cells with two different models. So we have a human glioblastoma model and also a metastatic breast cancer model. And so you can see here, these clearly defined tumors within the striatum of the brain. And then we imaged the, the rats in a 9.4 Tesla, so quite a high, high magnetic um, strength um, MRI scanner. And we performed various sequences, including gadolinium enhanced T1 weighted MRI, T2 weighted MRI, and the most important one, the T2 star MRI with the um, microparticles of iron oxide. And um, it's quite a busy slide, unfortunately, but what you'll see here is with the um, breast cancer model, what we showed is that here you can see quite easily on it, uh, what we call the standard T2 anatomical imaging that these tumors show up quite well. With gadolinium, before gadolinium enhancement, obviously we can't see the tumors. Interestingly, after gadolinium enhancement, we still couldn't see these tumors very clearly. However, after injecting these iron oxide particles, we saw an increase in hypo intensities. There is some before, which was interesting, and we can talk about that later, but actually afterwards, there was definitely more. And this is another example here where we can see more hypo intensities, whereas in our control mice, sorry, control rats, um, we didn't see any upregulation um, increase in hypo-intensities. And again, when we measured this, we showed that there was significantly more hypo-intensities um, that occurred in the ipsilateral hemisphere, so on the side of the tumour, um, in those rats injected with the VCAM MPIO contrast agent. And again, we showed in the histology that adjacent to these tumor cells, there were blood vessels with VCAM1 expression and these tiny beads, which highlighted by the arrows bound to these blood vessels. These are all around the edge of the tumor, which means that we could then detect where the edge of the tumor went up to. And similarly for the glioblastoma model, we showed a similar thing. And this time, again, you can see very well demarcated here the edge of the tumor in black. Okay. And similarly, we showed that this was significantly increased in terms of the hypo intensities with the VCAM MPIO contrast agent. And again, on the histology, and the bottom left corner is where the tumor is, and we've got blood vessels adjacent to it, which again show little beads which we can see on the MRI. Now, in order to confirm that actually what we're seeing goes around the edge of the tumor, what we did then was to overlay the T2 star imaging, so the, the hypo intensities that we detected on top of the T1 imaging. Now, it's difficult to see here because there's no T1 um, enhancement, so there's no gadolinium enhancement seen on the breast cancer model, but you can see these yellow dots here, which are highlighting around the tumor, even and where we know where the tumor is, even though it's not visible on our conventional imaging. And we showed that again, there was more enhancement outside of that area. Perhaps more obviously in the glioblastoma model, again, this time you can see where the tumor is, but interestingly, outside of that area, we could actually see spots, and this is highlighted in yellow, where the VCAM MPIO imaging, so the T2 star hyperintensities, 
extended beyond the edge of where the gadolinium enhancement was taking place. And so what essentially what this was showing is that although the edge that we defined on the on the gadolinium enhanced MRI is present, actually it's not accurate. And again, um, we showed that there was a significantly greater amount of hyperintensities outside the gadolinium enhancement when we compared the two imaging modalities. And again, this is just an example here where we define the edge of the gadolinium enhancement, and actually this goes well outside of that. So what I hope I've shown is that um, we've got an, a couple of examples of where this VCAM MPIO may be utilized, both firstly to detect tiny tumors for what we currently can detect, and then also to detect the invasive margin. Now, where are we going from here in terms of taking this forward? Well, obviously the next step is to try the, to take this forward into humans. And what we've got, to the, I mean, the, the good thing about translating this is, first of all, we're using systems which we already have available. So it doesn't require any new fancy technology. The infrastructure for magnetic resonance imaging is already available. All it needs to do is to tweak the imaging sequencing. Um, and then the most important thing then is to develop this contrast agent. So with some um, assistance from guys in chemistry, what they've been able to develop is this multimeric MPIO. So the issue with the iron oxide particles is that they tend to sequester in the spleen and in the liver. And so what they've done is they've bound lots of iron oxide particles together. And after they've finished imaging, they will naturally be broken down within the body and they can be excreted. So this multimeric MPIO with multiple iron oxide particles, these are actually on the nanoscale bound together. We're also um, developing a humanized antibody, which will mean that it doesn't react in humans. And then the next step is to develop a clinical trial, which is ongoing work. So just to close, so um, in summary, the, what I hope I've shown is that the management of brain tumors is, is dependent on accurate imaging. So radiotherapy and surgery are really dependent on us being able to detect these tumors, both when they're small, when they're most likely to respond to treatment, and also accurately so that we deliver the treatment to the right place without over-treating normal tissue. Um, although we have very good techniques at the moment, and as I said, our current gold standard is with magnetic resonance imaging, there are clear limitations to what we have available, and particularly with gadolinium enhanced MRI. So we're always trying to look for better ways to improve MRI. And using our preclinical insights, in particular understanding the biology of these tumors, what we've been able to do is to develop an imaging contrast which is rationalized and therefore makes sense. And so hopefully um, you can see, hopefully I've shown that we have a novel contrast agent with potential to also improve clinical outcomes and that would be the next step. So of course, um, this isn't just my work. I also have to acknowledge um, Professor Sibson, who was my supervisor and also her group um, who were pictured here. This was all based at the Oxford Institute for Radiation Oncology, um, and we're still working very closely together. We're writing up the second part of my talk, um, which is due for publication. And of course, I have to acknowledge our collaborators in Liverpool, particular Professor Jenkinson, and also Dr. Zakaria, Sheeta Zakaria, um, and also our collaborators in Portsmouth and in Norway. All right, so thank you very much. Thank you very much for an amazing talk, um, Dr. Cheng. And so I'll just give you a round of applause from here, uh, just by myself here, but I'm sure everyone's doing the rest as well. Um, so we're open for questions, and um, I've asked the audience if they could direct the questions to me, and I'll ask them here. And in case whoever wants to actually raise their hand, and the admin team will actually give uh, microphone access to them and can ask the question as well uh, orally. So the first question came is from uh, Hura Naraki. She's asking for, uh, she says, thanks for your interesting presentation. My question is a bit general and about selecting the targeting molecule. Uh, 
In the case of using peptides instead of antibodies, which type of peptides is more efficient? Uh, tumor cell surface targeting peptides or cell penetrating peptides? Um, so there are many different um, antigens which could be targeted, which we could potentially, for this in image and contrast in particular, we could functionalize against. We've chose VCAM1 specifically because of the biology in terms of it, it being expressed on the endothelial surface. Um, obviously, tumor cells do express lots of different types of antigens, and people are kind of trying to target them for therapeutic and also diagnostic purposes. The issue with targeting the tumor cells in the brain, and particularly for the functions that I've described, is that in order to get to the tumor, it has to cross the blood-brain barrier. And not many substances, antibodies in particular, or even any kind of targeted um, imaging agents will be able to do that. And so we selected this particular antigen based on the property that it is expressed on the endothelial surface. So yes, it's a surrogate biomarker. It isn't direct to the tumor, but what we've shown here, what I've hope I've shown here is that actually it's a good surrogate for where, where the tumor is meant to be. Um, so I, I can't say that one particular marker is better than the other. It depends very much on the purpose of what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Our next question is actually a um, request uh, by Zara Prokeso. She's asking if possible if you could actually write your email in the chat. So in case if anyone, anyone has better questions, they could ask you as well. Yes, well on, um, um, or probably maybe it's on your front, the first slide, the panel in there. And uh, I'll ask the next question, which I'm translating from Persian to English. Uh, so they've uh, said the highs and uh, thanks. And they've asked, they wanted to know if the contrast agent that you ate, they used. Um, does it sort of absorbs energy through magnetic um, sort of resonance, or does it only help uh, with delaying the relaxation time? Uh, so, I mean, obviously there are other applications for iron oxide particles, such as micro, um, magnetic particle imaging, which also can be used for kind of thermodynamic properties. We've not explored that. Um, there is a potential, if it's there, that it can be used for those particular properties, but we've not explored that. So we've primarily used it for imaging in T2 star waste imaging. But yes, absolutely. Iron oxide particles, if it's delivered there, could potentially be, be used um, mm -hmm. for therapeutic purposes as well. Cool. We, we have I mean, the group, not me specifically, but the group has also explored other theranostic tools, for example, um, attaching to radionuclide particles to also deliver um, kind of radiotherapy direct to the tumor in the same way with the VCAM1 attachment, and also looking at micro bubbles as well. So they are very interested in that particular protein, the VCAM1, but the antigen, but they are also applying it in different settings as well. Mm -hmm. Cool, thank you very much. Uh, another question by, uh, I've got a list of, I don't know, one, two, three, or nearly seven questions myself. Uh, yeah, feel free. I'm really interested. Yes, a little bit um, early. Next question, uh, I think there's two questions coming actually, is by Dr. Amin Tavaloy, and he's asking, what are the sensitivity, specificity, PPV and MPV of this imaging method, cons considering histopathology as the gold standard in your mice model? Yes. And um, yeah, I'll leave the next question after you answer this. Yeah, so we, we've not done those calculations. I mean, you can't, I guess it's difficult to do that in an animal model where it's purely experimental. You've only got tumors there in order to know where, how specific it is. You'll have to also test it in um, kind of a, a naive population based on what we have. And what I've shown is that those non-tumor bearing clearly don't, don't produce a signal. But um, would that be the same in other conditions, such as neuroinflammatory conditions, stroke? Um, yes, I think we have to consider that VCAM1 is not specific to the tumor and that other conditions can cause it to be upregulated. So other considerations that would need to take place include screening for all these patients properly um, and making sure we're choosing the right patients to use them on. Uh, understanding again the biology, well, if someone's had a, a, a recent stroke, and they've got a brain tumor, how effective this would be. So I, I don't think it's definitely, um, we can just use this and say, it's definitely going to be able to just pick up the tumor. It may well pick up other things that will need further testing um, in the clinical trials. Mm -hmm. And following on this, Dr. Tarle has asked, um, so he's directing this question specifically for the micro and glyme invasions beyond gadolinium enhanced regions. 
So his target, he was, his question, previous question was literally more specific towards this kind of region. Um, I'll, if the, again, audience, if they have any question, they can uh, feel free to raise your hand and the admin would actually give access to your microphone or webcam in case if you're interested to show your picture. <laughs> And uh, or feel free to write your questions uh, directly towards me and I'll ask them straight away. So my first question was regarding the first set of data that you had. You mentioned you injected, them, uh, injected various different tumor uh, cells that you had inside the heart. Was there a specific reason for that or? Yeah, so one of the, the IV injections. Mm, yes, yeah, so these are ultrasound guided injections, a very well characterized model. Um, so for brain metastases, we know that tumor cells arrive at the brain through the blood vessel, through the blood circulation. Um, in the past, we very much used tumor cells injected directly into the brain. Now, one of the criticisms is that this does not mimic how tumor cells will naturally travel to the brain. So by injecting it into the heart, um, it's essentially, try, essentially trying to mimic the metastatic process. Now we're not essentially we're not necessarily looking at the biology of how tumor cells metastasize, so that isn't um, so I wouldn't say that was completely necessary, but at the same time it would also more closely mimic what we would naturally see, and also it means that we can see tiny tumors as well that's disseminated, whereas if we had to inject directly into the brain that wouldn't be possible to achieve. Mm -hmm. um, and so we were able to see disseminated tumors with, throughout the brain, and essentially we showed that we can't detect them with the current techniques, which mm -hmm. is uh, expected, and we were able to detect it with the VCAM MPIA. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we had a very interesting set of results to show that as well. Pre-contrast um, agent, after contrast agent, and uh, your use of um, biological contrast agent, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, where uh, Somehow I think we need to come up with a, a term as well, because Contrast agents, we use it, it's mostly kind of systematic, whereas uh, the, the things that you're doing is actually molecular imaging and maybe other molecular contrast agent or something. We yeah, have to like the contrast agent traces. I mean, it's kind of more mm. akin to PET, um, but of course it's not really therapy, but it's targeted like PET. It's exactly. To a biological yeah. Um, phenomenon. So, so yeah, maybe that's something you could develop. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, next question is regarding the set of histological data that you had in order to show that um, the VCAM expression is correlated towards the tumor. So mm -hmm. you had a very a set of interesting experiment that you've done where you performed histological data on the, through the top part, middle part, and the bottom part of the tumor. And mm -hmm. you were showing that, okay, the VCAM expression is actually close to it, both on uh, immunofluorescence and immunohistology. But um, based on the immunohistology data that you did the uh, three levels and you had three, um, um, sort of uh, uh, three histological um, images for that. Mm. Um, the expression level, uh, one thing I noticed, the expression level of VCAM was not correlated to the diameter of the tumor. So in the early part, there was more VCAM expression, then lower, and then maybe again a bit higher or something. Um, sorry, was this with the human biopsies? Um, no, I think it was the actual um, animal studies. It was the um, the one you section, uh, not towards the end uh, data that you presented, it was the earlier on data you had. You uh, had with the, for the invasive margin. Yeah, and then you had the, uh, the next slide after that was the immunofluorescence, uh, the VCAM expression, and also the mm. um, prior to this. Uh, maybe it was the... Way towards the beginning. Okay, I'm just trying to remind myself where at this one. No. Uh, the ones that, yeah, the, the ones before that, uh, actually, yeah, this slide, just the previous one, yeah, this one. So um, my question was, was it this one? Is it this anything? the one with, no, this is, it, it was it's after that one. Uh, so the after, <laughs> sorry. Maybe you made a mistake then. You had three histological is prior to that. Anyway, but what, what the, you had the slide where you, it's cross section through the tumor, and then you had the VCAM expression close to it. Um, um, it, it might be. Was, run, it um, was it this one? It was a histological data, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, here I showed VCAM1 expression closer to the tumor was, mm -hmm. was present. We also showed that there was also VCAM1 expression further away from the tumor as well. Um, and 
what we can't, although we can't see it closely here, actually there were isolated tumor cells throughout that. So actually it did extend beyond that, but near to, nearby there was VCAM1 upregulation. Um, mm -hmm. I hope that answers your question. Uh, yep, yeah, that's fine, absolutely. Maybe I made a mistake. Anyway, uh, there's another question someone asked, um, what are the sort of clinically used and commercially available iron-based uh, contrast agents in, that are used in the UK? Yeah, so at the moment, there's nothing that we use um, involving microparticles of iron oxide. We do use iron oxide particles, these ultra-small um, particles of iron oxide in liver imaging in particular. Um, they're not so commonly used, but we, we can use them for certain disorders of the liver. Um, but yes, most of the time we're, we're not using much iron oxide particle imaging. So I think there's a real um, space there for, for this to develop. And more um, importantly, the iron oxide particle imaging that we use at the moment, again, is also not molecularly targeted. Okay. And uh, following on that question, they're asking, um, other than thanking you for your great presentation and asking, is there any limitation for administration of uh, this microparticle, for instance, like renal function, or are there any toxic, toxicological sort of effects? Yeah, so we have done some animal studies um, assessing the safety of this, and there doesn't appear to be um, any kind of toxic effects on animals. Obviously, this would need to be tested in humans, and there'd need to be um, some early phase studies, which is the next step, um, mm -hmm. a first in man study. And I mean, part of the safety will also be ensuring that we use a humanized antibody, uh, and then also, as I mentioned in the clinical translation, us now developing this new platform. So rather than using microparticles of iron oxide, using these ultra small or nanoparticles of iron oxide, which we then kind of group together to form a larger molecule um, because these can be broken down and we have better understanding of the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of these ultra small particles of iron oxide. The animal studies didn't show any toxic effects. Um, all that they showed that was that the iron oxide ended up being sequestered within the liver and within the spleen, which on the level which we use as a contrast agent, so I wouldn't expect to be toxic, but of course there's always concern about things accumulating in the body, which we may not know about. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll ask the rest of the question really quickly. The other question I had was, why uh, are you not looking to using your interesting um, agents uh, on spec or PET, which I think is uh, something that you're looking to as well? Uh, yes, I, I, I don't think we have specifically looked at spec or PET, um, but yes, they definitely can be applied for that. Um, mm -hmm. Not the iron oxide particles, they, they would have to be combined with, for example, a, a radioactive tracer for PET, um, but certainly mm -hmm. VCAM1, we are looking at different applications um, as the microbubbles, radionuclide image, um, imaging, theranostics. Mm -hmm. And the next question I had, your VCAM, uh, was it sort of an antibody uh, or was it more like a protein that the VCAM1 would be the receptor? No, so the VCAM1 is an anti-VCAM1 antibody. Okay. Yeah. And uh, uh, did you use a recombinant version or was it the full size because um, I think, is it not going to be too big to pass the blood-brain barrier, which you actually clearly showed that it actually passes the agent that you have? Uh, no, so, the, so it doesn't need to cross the blood-brain barrier because it's just adjacent to the blood-brain barrier. Mm -hmm. So it's still within um, on the, in the luminal surface of the blood vessel. Um, so the, the antibody itself is, is commercially available and it's an, like a, an anti-mouse one because we're using it in mice. We also use anti-rat one for rats and that's why we also had developed the humanized one to, for it to target the human one. Um, but, but yes, these are all commercially available and we just use some clever chemistry to conjugate this and we could add around 30,000 antibodies to each iron oxide particle. Mm -hmm. And that was um, my next question is what tests you perform to ensure that the MPO does not detach mm. from the protein? And yes, so uh, so again with the assistance from our collaborators in chemistry, we've kind of done some assays which showed that this does bind, bind specifically. Now we won't, don't want it to just stay there forever. Um, and at some point it will break off because the protein will be cleaved. Um, but we showed that it stays out for at least 40 minutes because it takes around 40 minutes for us to administer before we can image um, to allow it to circulate throughout the body. And then um, when we image 
afterwards uh, we and we section the brains we showed that they are present and they're still bound so they're clearly bound to the surface of, of vcam1 mm -hmm. i've got two more questions but i only ask one because we're short of time and i don't want oh, to I'm fine yeah is there any more of your time because we said it's supposed to finish at um, within one hour um, so the question is, why did you inject the breast cancer cells inside the uh, brain? Uh, towards the, uh, these are the, your se uh, second the invasive yeah. margins. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so again, it is depending on the question. So the problem with the if we use the um, intracardiac model is that it would disseminate into the brain. But um, we wanted one large tumor, which we can follow and we can see it, it grow to a decent enough size um, for it to develop an invasive margin. And the problem is if we allowed these tumors to grow eventually and they had multiple tumors in the brain, then eventually they will grow so large that it will cause harm to the animal. And also um, we were interested in just one tumor rather than in multiple tumors. And we, it's harder to control for how, for how many tumors you get where they grow in the intracardiac model compared to the intracerebral model. Mm -hmm. So it just gave us a little bit more experimental control. Thank you very much. With that, I would like to once again thank you for your time and your amazing work and great talk. And I really look forward to see your clinical set of data hopefully very soon move into clinic as well, which is very promising um, agent and um, it will really work nicely in preclinical models and hopefully works in patients as well. And with that, I would like to end this session. And um, I just once again want to announce that bi-weekly we have these TPCF, uh, TPCF webinars. Feel free to come and uh, join us. And with that, I would like to end. And once again, thank you, Dr. Vincent Cheng, for your amazing work and your amazing talk. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.